Hello, everyone. This is the Free American Press with your host, Alexander Horat. Today, we're going to be having Andy Schickman, the president of Miles Franklin, on the show. But before we get into it, if you could please subscribe to the channel, that would be really appreciated and share the video with your friends. Hello, Andy. Thank you for being on the show. Great to see you, Alex. Sorry we had a hard time connecting. But I'm glad we finally did connect here a day or two later than normal. But it's good to see you, bud. Yeah, it's great to see you, too. So there's been a lot of things happening since we last talked, some really big things uh, going on in the banking industry. So I wanted to get your opinion on this uh, article, what this means to the to the United States. So here's the article. Wells Fargo tells its customers it's shuttering all personal lines of credit. So it's uh, right here. So I was wondering what this means for the United States and the people. Well, I think it's not a really good sign, to be honest with you, Alex. Before I answer that question, let's let's go back and, and talk about what we've seen prior to this over the last few weeks. We've seen a rush of money move into what they call the reverse repo market. And what the reverse repo market is, it's an overnight mechanism whereby the banks can take their money and give it to the Federal Reserve uh, where they've removed a, a, a limit. I think the limit was $30 billion in the evening. I think they're up uh, somewhere north of a trillion dollars right now. But what they're able to do is they take that money and they give it to the Federal Reserve overnight. Uh, the Fed then gives them treasuries uh, overnight. Or in this case, what the Fed is doing is paying them five basis points, five basis points. Now, when a bank makes a, a loan, uh, home equity or a car payment, or a loan for college or a mortgage or whatever, those rates can vary between three and seven or eight percent. So with five basis points, people out there remember that 100 basis points is one percent. They're giving their money because they have excess money to the Fed overnight for five basis points instead of lending it out into the system, which not only makes them money, but also creates money and inflation and velocity in the system, what the Federal Reserve wants. But instead, the banks are so reluctant to lend their money out into an economy whereby they're afraid of getting uh, their balance sheets further eviscerated uh, into an economy that um, I guess by their own actions is, is one that is too risky for them to lend their money into. So instead of getting 5%, let's say, which would be a hundred times higher than five basis points, they are giving it to the Fed with safety for next to nothing. What that says to me is the banks don't want to lend. They're afraid of, of what's coming and they're reining in. Now, when we look at Wells Fargo, and there are other banks, big banks, that have done the same thing, closing their credit lines. Look, banks make money by lending it. When you deposit money into a bank and they pay you less than a half a percent on a, on a checking or a savings account, they take that money and they lend it out into more various forms of, of, of lending programs, like a line of credit where you may pay 5%. So they're paying you a half a percent and they're making five. It's a great business model. But ask yourself, why would they rein that in? Why would they literally cut off one of their prime sources of revenue um, if everything is on the rebound? And, and the answer is, I think they're frightened. They're afraid to lend it out into the public. Um, when I uh, moved down here to Florida recently, and I have a good credit score, and I make enough money where I could have paid cash for the house that I, I bought, but I wanted to take out a significant mortgage because I was able to secure a 3% mortgage. So a 3% mortgage when money creation and inflation on the latest CPI figures are at 5%. That's free money. Now we know that those CPI numbers are, I think anyway, are massaged and changed. In fact, they don't even take into account food and energy. And I don't know about you, but you know, maybe if you don't have to eat or drive anywhere, those numbers are realistic. But the point of it is, is that if you go to the grocery store, you can see just what the CPI is lacking. Um, I'll tell you that if, if you can take out a loan at 3%, when inflation is running almost twice that, it's, it's free money. So in doing that, it took me 12 weeks. I have almost 780 credit, and it's pretty darn good. And um, 
And it took almost 12 weeks for it to the point where I almost said, forget it. I'll just, I'll pay for it. I, I can't do this anymore. The questions and the litany of, of submissions and I mean, pages and pages and pages and back and forth. What used to be an easy experience where you would show a, uh, a mortgage broker your, or a lending institution your, your two years worth of W-2s and your savings account information and maybe your investments and boom, there you go turned into 12 weeks of back and forth and I almost lost my mind. The point I'm getting at with all of this is that they don't wanna lend money because they're afraid. They're afraid that the economy cannot sustain uh, or maintain the ability to service all of the debt that's out there. And I think it's a very ominous sign, Alex, I really do. Yeah, it seems like some pretty big warning bells. So we see the banks are starting to do this now, Wells Fargo, like I think it's one of the top three biggest banks in the world. So um, what are they preparing for? Do you think there's going to be some major um, banking crisis within the next few months? Or what do you think they're getting ready for? I guess your guess is as good as mine. But when an institution of that size cuts off a prime source of revenue, when the repo reverse repo market is is uh, at a trillion dollars a night, um, you know that that should tell you what's going on here. You you have uh, you have so much money out there that the banks could lend into existence um, and could help stimulate the economy with. Uh, instead, they'd rather safeguard it, pull it back in. In the case of Wells Fargo, in favor of their credit cards, already are charging 18%. So they cut off people's lines of credit when they need it most at three or four or five percent, and they give them a credit card at 18%. I think they're afraid of um, of what's coming, and and maybe an 18% return, even in the article that article you you mentioned, they talk about in favor of their credit cards. So maybe 18% return starting. Uh, is uh, a return that they feel is justified uh, for the risk, but 5% isn't. Um, it's a big deal. And I think that they are, you know, maybe it's, it's some sort of a, of, a, um, of a get real moment where we start to see um, price discovery that's real. You know, we have all time highs in stocks, bonds, and real estate at a time when interest rates are at all time lows, uh, at the tail end of a pandemic, when 130,000 small, small businesses are shuttered and gone forever, which were traditionally the backbone of this economy, usually would uh, comprise over 40% of GDP. And so when you see um, a, a market that has been propped up through government stimulus um, for the last year, uh, and sky high valuations as a result of it uh, in equities, in real estate and in bonds. Um, I think, you know, maybe they're waiting for some sort of a, of a correction or a reset or some sort of a of an environment where they feel a little bit more comfortable lending money out at a three or a four or five percent return, because uh, I find it baffling. This is the you know, these are prime sources of revenue for, for these banks and to cut it off is a big, big deal when you're talking millions and millions of clients. And uh, I think it is ominous. It portrays that they expect some sort of an event, whether it be a stock market sell-off or a bond market uh, sell-off or, or, and the thing of it is, when I say stock market and bond market sell-off and real estate, they're all positively correlated, maybe for the first time ever. Um, it used to be stocks and bonds were inversely correlated out, so they were called risk on, risk off. But you have an environment where interest rates have been held down so long that if they rise, not only does it blow up the real estate market, uh, it blows up the mother of all bubbles, the bond market. But who in their right mind would buy stocks at all time highs when you can receive treasuries paying a fair rate of return? In 1994, when I bought my first house as a 24 year old man, I um, young man, I uh, paid eight and seven eighths interest rate. Eight and seven eighths on a hundred and seven thousand dollar mortgage. Um, you know, can you imagine what eight and seven eighths interest would do to this economy right now? It, it, it would blow things up like you cannot believe. Um, and when you have interest rates on the ten year Treasury right now at at uh, uh, what is it? Last I looked, it was um, one point two percent. Yet 
inflation is running 5%. So we're in a situation right now when you factor real interest rates, we're actually negative. And that's that type of negative real interest rates have created this environment of speculation and of, uh, uh, of price distortions. You see interest rates move up uh, to a real value where the market controls interest rates instead of arguably the Fed buying it. You know, people are saying, well, if interest rates have fallen over the past month or two by 50 basis points, which is a big move from roughly 1.7 to 1.2, that's a huge move. Doesn't that mean that inflation fears are off the table? Well, um, because if you have low interest rates, uh, you would then suspect that inflation would fall. Um, to Otherwise, if you have high inflation, you need to have high interest rates to compensate. But uh, in other words, are, are, is the market saying that this transitory uh, phenomenon is real? Uh, some people think it is. Some people think we're fight, fighting a deflationary uh, force that uh, when things start to go back to normal, it will be more of transitory. I don't know. I don't. I think it's for real. And I think the only person or the only entity foolish enough to buy 10-year treasuries paying 120 basis points with inflation running three times that calculated on a bogus CPI number is the Fed. And they're trying to hold down the back end of the bond market. At some point, interest rates have to rise. If the Fed continues to monetize the debt, that creates massive inflation, which raises interest rates. If the Fed backs away from the bond market, interest rates rise on their own. In other words, both roads lead to the same place. So. Are they expecting interest rates to rise to the Fed to normalize their balance sheet, a reset of sort? I don't know. Um, whatever they're expecting, Alex, it's, it's real because you don't see, you know, really unconventional moves like this unless it's, it's something significant. Yeah, I agree. I think the last time we saw a really big banking event like this was, you know, closer to the 2008 recession. So it's definitely one of the biggest things that has happened in a long time. So that brings me to my next question. Do you think there's going to be, a, you know, basically a credit shortage? Because America is basically living off credit. There's a lot of people who are, you know, maxed out credit cards and everything else. So do you think if there is a credit sh uh, shortage, this will lead to some sort of deflation, you know, in the housing market? Basically, money will get tighter. Um, what That's what this is. It, it is the beginning of reigning in credit. Um, I think it, it could very well lead to that, obviously, because we are addicted to, to credit like a, a junkie is the heroin and you pull away that needle, there's problems. Uh, in, in a deflation or a depression, he who loses least wins. Um, and, you know, the question is, is it inflation or deflation? It's definitely a deflationary environment with all the debt we see. And the Fed has tried to combat that with inflationary policy. The problem is, look at the reverse repo market, look at Wells Fargo, they're not playing ball. In other words, commercial banks aren't lending money into existence. So what I also think this could lead to uh, is a digital currency, uh, a Fed token, uh, where the Fed can sidestep the commercial bank lending process and spend money into existence. I think this brings us one step closer to uh, a Fed token because uh, you know if, if there is no inflation and there is no velocity, it becomes very difficult to service the debt and there comes in your deflationary scenario. This is why I believe what we will see is something called hyper stagflation or a very stagflationary event where you have rising prices calculated or um, um, associated with little or no economic growth. Um, so I'm looking for a, uh, an event where, you know, arguably if this were to play out to its extent, you would see a, uh, the Great Depression meets the printing press type of an event. Okay, yeah. So we, uh, you were talking a little bit about the Great Depression. And one thing that happened there was the closure of many banks. Uh, many banks went out of business. They shut their doors. People couldn't get their money out. Do you think um, once other banks follow suit and getting rid of credit, basically, do you think we could see a run on the bank and banks closing? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, maybe, maybe that's why you see the bail-in legislations and the gating legislations on money market accounts. See, they're, they're, they're also afraid uh, of, of breaking the bank, uh, or, or shall I say not breaking the bank, excuse me, breaking the buck, uh, where it's a run on money markets as well, where 
with interest rates so low like this, um, if they keep, if the money keeps sloshing around out there and um, they're afraid of a lot of things. They're afraid of, of a run on the banks. They're afraid of a run on the money markets and they're trying to do all they can to keep things orderly. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know how it all plays out, Alex, but I, I do think that, um, I do think that at some point, uh, a run on the bank certainly is 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 plausible. I mean, ask yourself why would anyone want to keep money in an institution earning next to nothing with all of the systemic risk? And that's the problem with the banking sector is that they're all tied so closely together. If one falls, the systemic reaction would bring many down with it. And uh, I guess what I'm seeing is our banks reigning in their credit. Maybe it's some sort of a of a, of a credit crisis uh, or, or a problem where uh, if markets collapse, credit dries up like that and margin calls and you have big problems if you do not have credit to service uh, the, the massive accumulation of debt. Um, and really the problem is that these low interest rates only encourage more debt. So could you experience a run on the money markets? Yeah, and that's why there's gating. Could you experience a run on the banks? Yeah, and that's why they have bail-ins too. So um, I think these are interesting times to say the least, Alex. And, and uh, I, I don't recall ever seeing something like this where uh, a massive bank would just cut off one of its main legs of, of, uh, of uh, revenue uh, preemptively. And I think it, again, it's ominous for sure. Yeah, I definitely agree because they didn't give any advance notice at all really to their customers and I was reading that a lot of them are going to get bad credit scores now because of what Wells Fargo um, you know did. Yes it, yes and and it's it's really a bummer because it it just shows that they canceled their line of credit uh, so it will negatively impact their their credit score it's nothing too much to worry about but but here again uh, I think the bigger problem is why is Wells Fargo doing this if things are supposedly on the rebound. And, and that's the bigger question to ask. And why is the reverse repo market blowing up? Why aren't the banks lending that money into the economy? Um, if it was a strong, robust economy, uh, you would expect to see that. Instead, they're giving it to the Fed, earning next to nothing with safety. And, uh, and that's really the, the moral of the story here. You put the two of them together and you see the biggest banks in the world are afraid to lend. Yeah, and I have to say, it's pretty funny that they're doing this now uh, with, you know, uh, Basel three and everything that's going on, it seems. So, so you're basically talking about the domino effect. So how can people prepare for this credit crisis? Get out of debt, pay yourself first, stay out of debt. Um, you know, that, that's what this is all about is that, you know, um, in the United States, people believe that taking on credit card debt and mortgage debt and college tuition debt and all these forms of debt are just to write a passage, but it really, you know, it shouldn't be. Uh, it, it, letting the laws of compounding interest work for you instead of against you is really a, an important thing. I guess I would give two pieces of advice. Number one, pay yourself first, no matter what. Savings is important, uh, really important. And number two, pay down your debt. And if that means adjusting um, standard of living, cutting cable bills, uh, you know, um, getting rid of unnecessary things, making coffee at home instead of going to Starbucks, little choices day by day to save money, to get ahead and to stay out of debt uh, will make a really big difference when interest rates normalize. Uh, and, um, and they will at some point. And um, so I think that's really the biggest thing here is to you know, get your, your house in order and to uh, minimize your uh, dependence on debt because in, like I said, in a depression, or if what you're saying is true, where we see these massive deflationary forces bearing down upon the U.S., and a lot of people think that's going to happen. It's just, is it met with massive inflationary uh, reaction by the Fed? But if we see that in a depression or a massive deflation, he or she who loses least wins. And the problem in that environment is the inability to service your debt. And if you lose your job, as an example, or there's an unforeseen medical emergency, where you can't work or whatever it is, now what? So you have to have savings. You got to minimize your, your, your exposure to debt and pay yourself first. Yeah, I definitely agree. So 
I think um, there could be a deflation. We're seeing, you know, deflation with the lumber prices finally when they've been increasing, you know, astronomically uh, for uh, quite a few months. So how do you think gold and silver are going to be in a deflationary, um, you know, economy? How, how I'll answer that question in one second. But, you know, a lot of these inflationary price price inflation uh, a lot of the price inflation that we see is related to supply chain bottlenecks and uh, that has a lot to do with it and 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 that can be transitory and it can also be very vicious as we've seen and uh, you're starting to see prices normalize a little bit as the supply chains sort of loosen up and and open up but um, uh, you know I think that if we see a, a deflationary scenario, uh, the, main, the main issue is counterparty risk. And um, actually most people think that gold, let's talk about gold for a minute, we'll skip silver for a second, but a lot of people believe that gold is best used or, or is, best, um, is a tool best serviced against inflation or it protects you against an inflationary environment actually. There's a man, I think his name is Roy Jaskram. He wrote a report uh, a long time ago. I've read it several times throughout the years. And he basically, the, the summation of the report was that actually gold performs best in a deflationary environment uh, where counterparty risk prevails because uh, gold is one of the only assets in the world that is not simultaneously someone else's liability. You don't rely upon a counterparty to perform when you have an ounce of gold. Uh, you've never seen someone begging for food or looking for a, a home, a roof over their head, rather a place to sleep with a pocket full of gold. Now, silver is a little bit different because of its industrial applications. Uh, silver is, is in a unique asset, Alex, in that it's one of the, like, like gold as an example, is pretty much only on a, on a monetary level. I mean, it has some minimalistic uses in industry, but its primary uses for thousands of years have been in monetary, uh, in wealth preservation. Um, silver, on the other hand, might be the only asset that has uh, massive demand on either side of it. Uh, you have, uh, on one end, you're bracketing both sides with demand. On one end, you have a, a huge uh, industrial demand that is growing and increasing in green and, and digital. Um, the applications for silver is nothing conducts uh, like, like silver does, and it's, it's indispensable in so many uh, applications that are, that are growing and expanding, but it also has tremendous uses in um, lately, uh, or rather not uses, but has garnered tremendous demand on a monetary side. So you have an asset like copper, which is only industrial, an asset like gold, which is only monetary, but silver is both. In fact, if you look at the numbers over the last year and a half, uh, Steve St. Angelo from SRS Rocco report published a chart that showed that over the last year and a half, the, uh, the monetary demand has outpaced by a two to one, almost, actually almost over two and a half to one pace over an industrial demand. Now that's something I never thought I'd see. And there's been an explosion in, in the uh, awakening rather, an explosion in demand for the monetary aspects of silver. So, you know, when you talk about a deflation or a depression, you could see the industrial side of silver pull it down. But it has many of the same attributes that gold does in terms of wealth preservation um, and the monetary applications or the monetary realization, rather, of silver is, has uh, experienced kind of a renaissance. And, and you're seeing people all around the globe acquire silver and um, in, a, in a very voracious way. So uh, it may have a muted effect in a, in a deflation or a depression. Uh, either way, I think the issue here is to find a uh, refuge or a safe haven from a dollar which is going to be in trouble. And when everyone is locked into dollar-based assets and vehicles, uh, if we see some sort of a dollar event, like maybe Wells Fargo is preparing for, you better buckle up. And I think that's why they're doing that. And that's why you're seeing record money into the repo market. And you're seeing record deliveries off the COMEX for a, the last year and a half. And the biggest money in the world has been de-dollarizing for a while and preparing for something, whatever that something is and how close we are to it is certainly debatable. But 
their actions are speaking much louder than uh, than the rhetoric uh, that we see around us. Yeah, I think you're right about, you know, uh, deflation and depression that gold and silver would perform well, because we saw, you know, during the greatest depression, there was a famous quote, uh, can you spare a dime, basically, and that was a mercury dime. And people in a deflationary time, you know, they want to get hard, you know, assets like gold and silver. And I definitely think it's better paying yourself in gold than paying yourself in paper, right? So I think you're, uh, you're, you're definitely right. I think um, gold and silver would perform better than the dollar in a deflationary event. Absolutely, no question about it. Um, and so that's what really the takeaway from all of this to me is that gold and silver are wealth and they're less an investment to me and more about wealth. And in times of great uncertainty, where you see really uh, you know, seminal moment, I guess, where you see large institutions taking drastic measures <clears throat> like they are, I think the need for gold and silver in one's portfolio becomes more stark. Uh, and it's not about getting rich. It's not about investing. It's about preparing for what is coming down the pike. Yeah, I think you're right, because, you know, keeping gold, you know, keeps you out of debt. It's a good way to save, first of all, and it's it's you can't print it away. You can't print away gold and silver like the dollar, like the Venezuelan Bolivar that we saw was pretty powerful, but got you know printed away in the thin air. Just uh, another paper currency that became worthless. Uh, I, yeah, so they just lopped off a bunch of zeros where the 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 Bolivar note was the million Bolivar note now is one, but that doesn't even buy you that million Bolivar note now that they made one for use in daily daily transactions, easy daily transactions. Uh, it doesn't even buy you a cup of coffee. So a million Bolivar wouldn't even buy you a cup of coffee. Now it's one, but lopping off the zeros doesn't do anything. It doesn't change anything. It just makes makes it more convenient to go to the store, if there's anything there, instead of bringing a wheelbarrow with you, you're able to bring something more manageable. <clears throat> yeah, definitely true. I uh, think we could be seeing that with the US dollar as well. So I wanted to ask you, Andy, for the viewers, is there a gold and silver special uh, this week? Yeah, so uh, we have several specials, Alex. Uh, we um, are still running the $20 gold piece extra fine at 129 over. And, and if people are buying gold, it's a pre-1933 $20 gold piece. I sent you an image last week. We still have about 500 left and they're amazing. And if you're gonna buy gold, I think it's one of the best choices out there. Uh, in terms of silver, we have the Wall Street Kilo Silver Bar at 429 over. Uh, we also, um, have the PAMP Swiss 10 ounce silver bar. Now these are a little bit more expensive and, and they're $5.50 over. But I think if anyone looks around, you'll see it's the best price in the country. They're amazing 10 ounce bars. They come with uh, uh, documents or, or certificates of authenticity that with uh, the number printed on the certificate matches the bar number. They're the nicest 10 ounce bars I've ever seen. Um, and uh, when we are done with our, uh, our talk here today, I'll send you images so you can post those in the notes for, for your viewers. The bottom line is this, when people um, contact us and, and, and mention your name in the subject line and send us an email at, at andy at milesfranklin.com, uh, I will make sure they get the best price on whatever it is that they're looking for, Alex, make sure that they're getting the best price in the country out of respect to you and what you're doing. and. Uh, Every sale that we do from your listeners will donate a little money back to help you continue to do what, uh, what you're doing so well and, and uh, expanding interest uh, for around the world and, and hopefully for younger people out there who realize that gold and silver have been wealth for 5,000 years plus. Uh, it's not an investment. It is, but I don't look at it that way. It's, it's a wonderful way to put money away uh, uh, for the future. And um, in, in a manner that, you know, arguably will be a refuge or a safe haven when traditional assets uh, run into trouble, like Wells Fargo might be portraying, um, when interest rates rise, when a depression seeps its way into, uh, into the economy, or when hyperinflation, whatever it is, and getting it, whether you see hyperinflation, whether you see a Great Depression, whether you see stagflation, whatever you see, 
gold and silver should be part of your portfolio and history has proven that that they will perform very well for you when you need them most. Yeah, I agree. Gold has outlived, you know, any bank around as a real, um, real money, real wealth. So I definitely agree with you, Andy. And if anybody, uh, when you write Andy at Miles Franklin, if you could mention the Free American Press, that'll be uh, really great. And yeah, Andy, is there anything else you'd like to add in this video? Uh, look, I guess these are just, you know, one of the things, um, you know, Alex, playing sports has been uh, something very important to me uh, my whole life. And uh, if you've ever played sports, whatever game you play or watching pro sports, you can sense something in a missed putt, uh, in a missed field goal, in a made catch, in a stopped goal, um, something, just a little thing where you sense a change is about. You might not be able to articulate it, but you can sense something within you. And when you play sports, I think you know what I mean. Uh, even if you're playing golf with yourself, uh, um, you can sense a change um, when you have a good shot and everything starts to change. What I'm getting at is that I think you need to trust your gut. I think people are sensing that something's going on, um, that things are changing and that um, not all is rosy. And I think Wells Fargo is showing us that, that, um, you know, an economy that is supposedly so great, they should be willing and eager to extend lines of credit to the public. Um, the fact that they're not, to me, only exacerbates the feeling that I have that something's not right. Um, so I would say to people, trust your gut, get your house in order, prepare, not just financially, spiritually, uh, emotionally, physically, uh, have food and water and uh, home protection and um, you know when you see movements like this it to me tells me we're getting closer than we ever have to some sort of an event and I don't think you'll get much more advanced warning than this type of movement from one of the biggest banks in the world we'll wake up one day and things will be different and if you're not prepared um, and there is a credit problem if you're not able to get money out of the ATM if you don't have you know, some cash at home and small bills, because in a, in a moment like that, in, in any moment, cash should be king at first. You should have a few thousand bucks and fives and tens, not big bills, like hundreds, too hard to break, but five, tens and twenties. Um, be prepared, get prepared, get your house in order, stay out of debt, whittle it down. Um, these are the things that are very important right now. And I say that just because I can sense it and I can feel it and I can see it in the actions of the reverse repo market and what Wells Fargo just did on top of everything else we've seen the last year and a half. It, it only adds um, an exclamation point to the conviction that I have as that we are entering a period of time where um, people need to get ready and buckle up. Yeah, I, it's uh, really important too because we are seeing some big things when big players make such big moves like they are right now you know something's going on something's about to happen big and like you said it can change in an instant like it did in venezuela it only changed in like um basically an instant it changed everything you know your money was worthless everything so i definitely think there's something big coming down the pipe and i'd like to uh thank you for being on the show today andy and i hope we can uh, have you on uh, next for, uh, have you on again soon Absolutely. I look forward to being here every Friday. Next next Friday is going to be a little challenging. We'll find a way to work around. I get in early in the morning. Sorry, I'm having an allergy attack. My eyes are watering. Um, look, uh, Alex, I, I admire what you're doing. I want to keep being part of it. Yeah. Let's get the word out. I'm happy to help. And uh, little by little, I think we'll make a difference. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you have a great rest of your weekend. And I'll look forward to circling back with you uh, next week, hopefully Friday. Well, that sounds good, Andy, and I'd like to thank all who was watching. God bless. God bless.